All right, friends, I'm so excited for who you get to meet today. I'm sitting here with my new friend, Sarah Gristwood. Sarah, welcome to Girls' Night. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Um, Can you tell us who you are, what you do, and a fun fact about yourself? (laughs) Well, I'm... Oh, I was a film journalist for a million years. Then I began writing books about women's history. And most recently, I've edited Secret Voices, an anthology of women's diaries, a year of women's diaries. The fun fact I'd planned to share was that I once shared a page of a poetry anthology with William Carlos Williams. But I feel the fun fact may need to be that sitting here beside me, there is, well, theoretically, he's a dog. He's more like a great white shark covered in fur. So if something (laughs) suddenly appears, that's Rex, okay? Rex, okay. I love it. I love it. Well, Sarah, when you... um, I have a book of my own coming out on Mm -hmm. April 30th, which is really Mm -hmm. exciting. And um, in it, I'm helping women uh, navigate some of the big decisions that we're faced with kind of during the 25 to 35-year-old age range. And one of the things that I became just totally fascinated with was Mm -hmm. what this has looked like for past generations. Like Mm. what decisions and options my mom was faced with and my grandmother and women before them. Because I noticed as as we're making decisions about motherhood and marriage and career and all these different things, we are being pushed and pulled by Mm -hmm. historical precedent. Um, Yes. So I talk about it a little bit in my book, not Uh as much as I, like, I mean, I could have devoted the whole thing to it. But so when your name came across my email, I just was overjoyed. And I sent a, yes, please, can we have her on the show back immediately? Because I, I want... I want to hear from you. Like Mm -hmm. I've been brought so much peace and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Um, And also like, I'm also a little angry (laughs) as I've gotten to hear some of the things that women have gone through, you know, through time. So anyway, um, tell us, tell us about a year of women's diaries. Tell us about the book and like where the idea for the book came from. Yeah. And first, just let me say, I think the women of the past would have been totally with you on the decisions and the peace and the anger. So Mm. Women's diaries have been a huge interest of mine for many years. So when the idea of, of me writing a book about it came up, I jumped at it, of bringing together all these voices. Because I first started studying them when I was in my 20s, but an awful lot has changed and has come out. It was a, it was a while ago, let's admit. So much more material is available now. And people have gone looking for such a a, a much, much greater range of diaries, not just from the wives of famous men or famous novelists, people like Virginia Woolf or Sylvia Plath, but from pioneer women, from abolitionists, from with people of all races all ethnicities, all backgrounds. And what I did find there, it it often astonished me, but there was also what I think you were suggesting, that sense of familiarity, that guess what? Many of the dilemmas we think of as just being today were absolutely explored by the women from even several hundred years ago. It's so it's so cool. Where did so I, where did people get these diaries? Mm. Well, it's a real mixture. Uh, some of them, of course, were published even with the the writers, the original writers' own knowledge. Others were preserved just by chance. I mean, we all know about Anne Frank writing in the secret ghetto in World War Two, but in in, in the, the secret annex and you know, in, a victim of the Holocaust, her diary was preserved 
We know her sister Margot wrote a diary. No trace of that survives. But some of them have had a pretty interesting history. You mentioned women of perhaps 25 to 30. Well, a couple of these diarists, women who went on to become very famous, wrote a youthful diary in code, codes which were only cracked years after their death. And two of them, two of them particularly, are... Beatrix Potter wrote a diary in code, you know, the author who wrote Peter Rabbit and all those little tales. But the point is she didn't find herself. She didn't find her path in life. She couldn't break free of her family until she was in her 30s. When she did, her coded diary ended. But before that, she was writing out her, well, despair, really. And Florence Nightingale, uh, so famous as, you know, the Lady of the Lamp, Crimea, the pioneer of nursing, she again wrote a diary, but again, she was 30 before she managed to cease being a Victorian young lady at home and actually find the path that made her so famous. And her early diary, again, writes, my present life is suicide. But guess what? She then moved and bloomed. Okay, I have goosebumps and I might cry. I just need to oh. put that oh. out there. Tell me, okay, why, how, what code, code how? How were they writing okay. in code? Okay, uh, Florence Nightingale didn't actually use code. Beatrix Potter did this incredibly complicated one that uh, a man sat down after her after her death, you know, with her diaries, and tried to crack it. He was just on the verge of giving up when finally he got it. He got the key. The other diary in code I was thinking of was a woman called Anne Lister. Now, here we've seen her life dramatised on TV as Gentleman Jack. But 200 years ago, she was lesbian. She was writing about her affairs, very openly, very frankly. So she had, by the standards of her day, a good reason to keep her diary in code. But the point for me was almost that someone like Beatrix Potter, she wasn't writing anything like that. You know, she was writing about, oh, taking her pet rabbit for a walk on a lead and how she'd had all her hair cut off after an illness. But she was also writing out her feelings of frustration, of anger, of the way the male establishment wouldn't take her seriously. And I guess in her day, that was as transgressive as Anne Lister's sexuality. I have so so many questions. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) They really do use these diaries often to voice feelings that they couldn't voice openly in their society. What was, so you said that with Florence Nightingale and mm. Beatrix Potter, they mm. had sort of a shift around their 30s. What yes. does life look like before then yeah. that Florence Nightingale yeah. said, my well, current life see, is suicide? They were both Victorian young ladies from good family. So what they were supposed to do was basically nothing until they married. And if they didn't marry, they're nothing. And that was the problem. Florence Nightingale knew what she wanted. She wrote in her diary about how she could happily do without husband, children, but she absolutely felt she had to pursue this need to to serve humanity and in a medical way. But of course, at the time she was writing The Victorian Age, well-brought-up young ladies didn't go off and tend the bodies of strange men. It was a disreputable profession. It was hard, wasn't really a profession for women at all. 
That's why she had the fight on her hands. How did she break free from it? Well, I think she just, with a lot of determination is the real answer. And, you know, I think she she recruited some support from a few, you know, influential family friends and so on. And then, of course, Mm. quite soon she became this immensely famous figure, the lady Mm. with the lamp. Mm. That's so cool. Okay, so I want to know, after looking through, you know, after combing through Mm -hmm. four centuries of women's Mm -hmm. diaries, what were some of the common like themes, I guess, yeah. that you were seeing in women's lives? Like what has life looked like for us for the last four centuries? I guess one of them was that sense of, of frustration, anger, if you like, because even though, you know, a lot of them sort of just didn't, didn't openly say, I'm furious, they, they wrote with wry humor. Um, or they disguised it. Beatrix Potter, uh, when she went to show, before the Little Tales, she did these drawings of fungi, which were immensely accurate. They're still, they're massively respected for the scientific establishment today. They're still used as teaching studies. But at the time, when she was given an, uh, an introduction to the director of the Great Botanical Garden at Kew, he just brushed her off. And Beatrix wrote, it's it's very frustrating, very annoying for a shy person to be treated as if they were conceited, especially when the shy person happens to be right. And you do Mm. get a fair bit of that. So they, they weren't taken seriously. Yeah, that yes, and they also yes, and a lot of them were juggling with the sort of question that I think you touched on earlier about about whether they could make a life for themselves without marriage, whether they could marry and still keep their own identity. A lot of them had real concerns about that. And some of those questions were couched in such modern terms to me. There's one, 200 years ago, Elizabeth Fry, uh, well known here. She was a Quaker and she was known as a great prison reformer, reformer of women's prisons particularly. And she wrote about how she was worried whether her husband and children, 11 children, I think, uh, were distracting her too much from what she saw as her vocation, how her husband and children got annoyed, got jealous when she gave too much time to that vocation. It really is how to juggle a career and family. And guess what? That one hasn't gone away today. No, it sure hasn't. Um, what else were women? What were women expected to be like mm. through what? Like, what are some some? How have the expectations shifted in the last? Yeah, well, I think years? it's an interesting. I think that's where the diaries came in, in a way, because what women were on the whole expected to be was kind of sweet, cute, accepting not too vocal, and, of course, subordinating themselves to husband and children. So you've got someone like Sophia Tolstoy, the wife of, you know, the great Tolstoy, War and Peace, uh, writing very bitterly about um, how if you were married to a genius, you were supposed to, and she, you know, that that's very bitterly underlined, genius. You were supposed to feed and clothe and tend and make a house and make a comfortable atmosphere and bring up all the children the genius fathered but couldn't be bothered taking care of himself. And if ever you expected so much as a word of thanks from the genius, you'd be lucky. Um, And So really, I think it was that sense that a woman, this is what's changed, 
that a woman's destiny was husband and children. Now, many of these women, of course, wanted husbands. They, you know, they found men they loved. They wanted and adored their children. But all the same, there was that sense of, yes, but where do I come in? Again, something we know today. Yeah, yeah. I heard a statistic recently that talked about the amount of history that was, like amount of women's history that's been documented versus oh, men's history. Right. Do you well, know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I can't tell you in general, but certainly in the anthologies of diaries that were already out there, women, entries from women were nothing like 50%. It was more like, you know, 20% or 30% of the entries, even though the diary has been thought of as particularly a woman's form, because it is private, because it is something that, you know, women can do at home and don't expect to have to go out in the nasty big wide world and publish it. What, um, tell me about, what did you learn about, um, women's roles, um, kind of going from Victorian times through the Industrial Revolution. Like, how did the Industrial Revolution change life for women? Mm. Well, of course, one thing we have to say is that, unfortunately, the diary form and the diaries that have been preserved does tend to fade to, to get to, there's an undue proportion of upper middle class women, basically, who weren't necessarily working in the, fac in the factories and so on. That's partly where the work I mentioned earlier came in, that there has been a very conscious effort to get diaries from people like, oh, the Victorian maid servant Hannah Cullick, whose, you know, day is just extraordinary, cleaning the chimneys, cleaning the boots, cleaning, 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 cleaning. And I think the changes in women's diaries, well, one big one came about really before Victorian, before Industrial Revolution. It was in the it was a great big surge of women's diaries, diaries in general, in the in the 18th century. So 200 years ago or more. And I think that was partly to do with the kind of cult of sensibility that suddenly people's feeling, there was more of a premium on people's feelings. And people felt women felt allowed, even encouraged to write down their feelings because it proved what a kind of, you know, sensitive soul they were, much in the way that we might today. Whereas before that, perhaps, diaries had tended to be much more factual or a record of spiritual experience. Though my having said that, quite often, even in the earliest, anger comes through. I mean, I think the mm -hmm. earliest or almost the earliest diary in, the, in this book is from Lady Anne Clifford, who was writing more than 400 years ago. You know, she wrote, she, she was there at, at the funeral of Elizabeth I. But she got on very badly with her husband, who was trying, with the new king's assistance, to get her to give up her family lands, her maternal inheritance. And he, she was writing about what, whatever he says to me, I will never give up Let Westmoreland, her, her own property in Westmoreland. And how, how she wrote, my lord, her husband, was meant to come and spend the night with her, sleep with her that night, but he didn't because they'd had another row about this, this property. It seems like forever women have been trying to figure out their place mm. and how their place if their place is able to be, if there's still a place, a place for them, yes. if they are married and have kids, like where kind of where their place is in relation to a husband and kids. Yes. And then also like not necessarily feeling free to use their voices or to talk about yeah. how they really feel. And yeah. 
sort of that that, yeah, that no, tension. Yeah, indeed. And a lot of them do write very directly about it. I mean, I'm thinking of one in the early 20th century, Ivy, Ivy Jakey, she, who, who had a baby and then writing about how relieved she was to find that the impulse to create, to write, hasn't left her. But others, um, in other women, was another... Um, Naomi Mitchison was her name, saying that she and her friends had been talking about how they were all, I quote, done in by, done for by this business of babies. How much though they loved their children and their husbands, it was virtually impossible ever to get an hour together to themselves, except in the evening, and then they were too tired to do anything creative. Again, pretty familiar now. (laughs) (laughs) That is so wild. That is so wild. Um, Tell me, so one thing that I'm just really struck by Mm -hmm. is, you know, I know that you've gone through countless diaries. And I mean, I know when we write Mm -hmm. a book, we're we're really familiar with the material, but the fact that you know all of their names and the year, like the years and the details, it's... It's just really cool yeah. to, it's, that's really cool. And I, so I wanted to ask you, you know, why, why is it important that we mm. publicize these personal experiences? Mm. Like what, mm. what, why do we need, why do we need to hear these things? Because I think we need to know more than we already do what our foremothers were thinking and feeling and how better to do that than in listening to their own, often private, often secret voices. Because I came away feeling that the experience of women in the past was more adventurous, but also more nuanced, much less black and white than we tend to get from conventional history. And I think the real reason that matters so much to us is because it gives us strength. I I think that a lot of us who grew up in like, you know, the late 20th century, say, we often felt that we were frontline troops, you know, fighting the battles to be treated on equal terms in the workplace, that kind of thing. The battle to, um, you know, not have your partner grumbling, wait, about your work when you were at home. And to realize that there is this complete army of other women standing behind us who fought the same battles and moved things on does give an enormous feeling of support and security, or it does to me anyway. Me too. Me too. I wanted to to know out of all of the stories that you've heard, is there a, what's a story that surprised you that you were like, I didn't realize that women in the past were thinking this, or I didn't realize this was an option or yeah, just any surprising stories that you came across. Well, that Elizabeth Fry, the Quaker and her work and her family was a strong contender. Actually, there's another one from her about Um, how after a very hard labour, she wasn't managing to bond with her new baby. And you think, well, the term postnatal depression wasn't known in 1812 or wherever, whatever it was, but clearly the feeling was. But also, oh, another, um, a, a girl, a woman who died young, she died at 25 of TB, Mary Bashkirtsev, and uh, uh, exiled uh, an aristo, an artist. And she was writing incredibly directly and frankly about her ambition as an artist, how she wanted to be known, she wanted to be out there, how she wasn't interested in people it, it, who, who who weren't ambitious in any way, and how she didn't see why she should hide hers. 
obviously her early death. I mean, that's something we're a bit hesitant to say even today, a lot of us. Yeah. Her early yeah. death obviously meant her ambitions as, a, as an artist, a painter, weren't fulfilled. But I like to think she'd have been glad to know that after her death, her published diaries became a Victorian bestseller. So in a way, yes. she got the fame she wanted. That's, that's really cool. Um, what were some of the lessons that you've learned from women as you've Ooh. looked over the last right. 400 years? I guess one of the first would be that bad times do pass. I mean, a lot of these women went through some extraordinarily bad times, partly because of the age in which they were living. I mean, it's not in this book because it's written in a different format. But the first, when I read Fanny Burney's many-page description of undergoing a mastectomy without anaesthetic, my chief concern was whether I could get out of the library without throwing up on the floor. Um, okay. So in some cases, these women's hard times came from the, you know, the age in which they lived, but not always. A lot of it was depression, was self-doubt, was difficulties with a spouse in just the way we know today. But the bad times did pass, even for those few diarists who are known for the fact they didn't for their suicides, like Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Plath. There's an awful lot of strength and energy and fighting along the way. Um, mm. I think other lessons, I guess, I hadn't thought this before, but I guess it's that if women throughout all these centuries have really cared so much to preserve, to write about, their own identity, well, I guess what? Our own identity must be something worth preserving, you know? I think in a way, their value for themselves can give us a greater sense of our own value. Does that sound silly? Does that sound, mm. make sense? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's something that we think about now and to know... Yes women have been thinking about this forever. It's like, well, this is not, this, is, this isn't this is silly. Yeah. Okay, good. You know, you talked about how in the women who were, were growing up in the late 20th century, mm -hmm. you know, have felt like they were on the, mm -hmm. From you know, the tip of the sword, mm -hmm. fighting these fights and, and making change for us, which mm -hmm. we very much appreciate. Um, but also I think, uh, I think, women of my generation feel that a little bit too, because we're, it's not that we're, I mean, we are, we're fighting fights for yeah. women's rights oh, still yeah. today. Yes. Um, but also we're, we're navigating things that haven't been navigated before. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, the internet for, for one. Yes. And um, I, I'm wondering if, like what advice you think the the women who have gone before us, or even mm -hmm. you, because you've mm -hmm. been doing this longer mm -hmm. than we have. Yeah. Like what advice they would have for us or you would have for us as we're walking forward into a, I don't know, what feels like an unknown. Yeah, okay. I guess perhaps it's more important than ever if you are walk, walking into the unknown, I guess not to do what so many of us were raised to, not to wait for permissions effectively, not to do what a lot of women traditionally have done, which is wait for someone to tell them the rules, to look for rules to follow, because the good stuff happens when rules are broken. Yeah? And I think that's what some of these women would say. Did say, in fact. Oh, I'm not crying. I'm not crying. Oh, um, tell so so. I've been keeping a a diary myself mm. since I was 11 years old. Oh wow! Um, and dead? it's always 
Yeah, since then, yeah. Wow. Um, it's been a really... I feel like sometimes it feels like a really powerful exercise. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, it's easy to feel kind of silly. Like, mm. who cares? Or, you know... It, <laughs> Tell us, Don't do we worry. should we be keeping a diary? Yeah, well, believe me, uh, all, these diarists were there too. A lot of them write about why they keep a diary. And someone like Anne Frank saying, you know, isn't it silly for someone like me to keep a diary? Who cares? When in fact, of course, tra tragedy would make it, make her perhaps the best known female diarist of all time. Um, but no, a lot of them say, well, why am I doing this? One, an American writer called Elizabeth Smart, I remember she wrote, um, yes, this diary does sound vain, but that's what it's for, to write all the little niggles down and write them out of my system. So mm -hmm. I think there's, women use their diaries in a lot of different ways. That was certainly one of them. I mean, more recent, and but of course, there can also be celebrating life through the diaries. One, one of the more currently famous diarists I quote in the book is Oprah Winfrey, an impassioned diarist, of course. And she said that at a certain point, she ceased writing down all her worries and aggravations in the, di in the diary. Instead, she began to use it more as a kind of gratitude journal. And that's another thing, another way to go. A lot of mm -hmm. the diarists um, wonder whether they'll look back as old women to look back on their diaries and see how they were then. Some of them, of course, were, like the pioneers crossing America, were consciously recording a historic experience. But very often, I think Elizabeth Smart had it, write the stuff down and then hopefully move on from it. Yeah. I... Do you, um, when you look back over all of these diaries, you know, mm -hmm. something that... Something that I've felt for the last 10 years of my life is mm -hmm. that it feels like I'm having to figure out all of these really big, like biographically significant mm -hmm. decisions all at the same time. Like the, you know, this is who she was. This is who she married. This is who, mm -hmm. how many kids she had. This is what she did for work. Like all mm -hmm. of it is sort of figured out in this 10 year span. And so I've, I couldn't find a name for it. Um, I feel like young adult doesn't fit. It's, we're not, no. quarter life isn't exactly right. And so I, I started no. calling it the everything era because oh, okay. it oh, feels like everything okay. happens during this time. Um, do you see 25 to 35 being a significant season of women's lives like throughout history or well, has well, that changed? I think to some degree it's changed. <laughs> As in, you were supposed to get married, you know, these, these young ladies were brought out into society at age 18, basically. And if they hadn't married by the time they were about 22, they were considered to be over the hill. But again, remember Florence Nightingale, yes, I know. Again, remember <laughs> Florence Nightingale and Beatrix Potter. For both of them, it was... 30, Florence Nightingale, early 30s for Beatrix Potter, that they found their path. So, actually, and of course, although life expectancy is much greater now, much longer, all that kind of thing, I do mm -hmm. think that in a way, yes, some of the milestones, like 18, and actually like 30, did it's almost surprisingly were milestones in the past as well and not necessarily in a bad way. She yeah. says firmly yeah. as someone whose 30th birthday was a long time ago. <laughs> hey, listen. Um, <laughs> do you... Okay, you can... You do not have to answer mm -hmm. these questions because I didn't give you... A, I didn't give you a warning okay. that I was going to ask. But I'm wondering what in your life, 
Mm. what some of the expectations were that you, like what you grew up thinking you were supposed Mm. to do Mm. and sort of if you did what you were supposed to do, and I put, I should put supposed to in air quotes, if you did what you're supposed to do with your life or if you didn't. Oh, interesting. Well, I didn't grow up thinking that I just had to get, get married. I mean, I was past I was, you know, a, a more recent generation than that, obviously. I was absolutely focused on a career. But that was slightly, if you like, theoretical. On a day-to-day basis, I married an older man who was much more advanced in his career. So on a day-to-day basis, I did basically assume that his career, that his needs were more important than what I was doing. So in that sense, I did, yes, I did do what I was supposed to do. I'd like to think that because I was early writing articles, particularly about women and trying to free women's voices then, that I was also had one foot on the other path, as it were. Um, I did marry, I didn't have the children. But um, yeah, I think think whatever path you've taken, our foremothers were there, you know, were there first. Yeah, yeah. I, I love this. Sarah, I'm so, so grateful for your time and for your wisdom and um, for your, your, interest in women's stories and for elevating them so that we can hear them too and know that we're not alone. I just, I'm so grateful for your work. I cannot wait to read your book and um, we'll make sure to link to it everywhere so that that our whole community can get their hands on it. Great. I do hope you enjoy it and that others do too. Thank you. Thank you.